Our next presentation is entitled How to Make Predictions About the Next Decade. We're thrilled to be joined by um, Peter Skoblik, who is Senior Fellow of uh, Future Security here at New America and also the co-founder of Event Horizon Strategies. So thank you all so much, and here is Peter. This is an interactive presentation. Great. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, it's good to, to see all of you. Uh, set myself the, the, the not at all ambitious goal of talking about how to make predictions for the next 10 years. We may just dial that back to a few years for the next 10 minutes. But before I start, I just, what, you know, what are we talking about when we talk about making predictions about the future? Because I feel like, as one of the earlier participants said, we don't have a crystal ball. So how do we actually predict? What does that mean? And what I'm going to be talking about is putting probabilistic forecasts on future events, much the way that a meteorologist will say, okay, there's a 60% chance of, of rain or what have you. And, and, and the question is sort of like, why do we, why do, we do this? And my, my sort of abiding thesis is that all policies are predictions. So when we talk about, when we make claims like tax cuts will boost the economy, or sanctions will slow Iran's nuclear program, or travel bans will slow the spread of COVID-19, each of those things is like positing a causal relationship that we're not actually sure about. And so putting predictions, probabilistic predictions on whether those things will happen is a way of saying, okay, we're not certain. We think this is going to happen and it's a way of expressing the degree of confidence. It's also a way of prioritizing different policy uh, priorities that, that, that we may have because as an earlier panelist said, we can't cover the waterfront. So how do we decide where to allocate finite resources? Well, it makes sense to you know, allocate finite resources not only on the degree of like, importance that an issue may have, but on the likelihood that it may crop up. So you know, the, 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 the corollary thesis here is that regardless of what your political views are, whatever your ideological beliefs, whatever your, your interests are, nobody wants to advocate a course of action that has an outcome that they do not expect. We want to do the things that will have the outcome that we're advocating for. And so what this does effectively is it makes every policymaker a forecaster. Policymakers tend not to think of themselves that way, but this is the way that I think of them, and this is the way that I think of a lot of policy analysis. We make a lot of claims about the future, so policy analysts are also forecasters. One of the biggest challenges, though, is that we tend not to think probabilistically. We tend not to put odds on future events. Um, instead, what we do, we, I don't know, we resist this for some reason. Daniel Kahneman said we're not natural statisticians. I don't know if that's exactly true, but we don't do it. So the reason for doing it is that what we do instead doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense. So this is, if you can see this graph, um, this was done by uh, two brothers, Andrew and Michael, Mabusin uh, published in Harvard Business Review a number of years ago, and basically they took a group of people and they said, okay, we're gonna give you a bunch of like vague probabilistic words, you know, I mean, ranging from the not so vague like always to almost always, likely, frequently, probably, with moderate probability, maybe unlikely, rarely, never. And I mean, I ask you to think about the number of times you've heard those words today. Or if you like pick up, you know, your you know, latest issue of foreign affairs, like how many times you will find these words. And the problem with these words is that we all mean wildly different things by them. And this results in misunderstandings, not only in the policy making world, but also it just kind of like lets a lot of us off the hook, frankly, if we're not like, we're gonna say something's likely. But like, just to like point out a couple of the more egregious examples here, always, which to me connotes 100% probability. Apparently does not for all people. It can go down to like 85 or 90%. Never, similarly, apparently something that can never happen can actually happen 10% of the time, according to a lot of people. And then when you get to something like, you know, might happen, it, 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 effectively meaningless, effectively meaningless. So there is utility in quantifying the probabilities we put on things, if for no other reason that it enables clear communication. Being explicit about these things 
helps us understand one another and where we are. Um, this, of course, bleeds over explicitly into foreign policy. Um, the intelligence community has wrestled with the idea of quantifying forecasts since the time of Sherman Kent, when he headed the first uh, CIA predictive office during the 1950s, and he got very upset because he did a similar thing to the Mabusin brothers, and he found that like his analysts meant wildly different things by things like the word likely. So he was horrified. He encouraged quantitative forecasts, and he got a tremendous amount of pushback uh, because people said it would make them sound like bookies, and the intelligence community, of course, not bookies. Kent's response was, I'd rather be a bookie than a goddamn poet. And so now, you know, flash forward, you know, 60 years, and we get Intelligence Community Directive uh, 203, which was put out by James Clapper in, in 2015. And this is great, right? We're assigning probabilities to words that you see in intelligence community assessments until, like, you get to likely, let's say, where there is a 55 to 80 percent probability is what likely connotes. Now, that's better than 40 to 90, I guess, but it's not super specific. And you think about decision making and you think about the stakes that are on the line, or if you draw an analogy, let's say you're a poker player. If you can't tell the difference between a 45-55 bet and a 55-45 bet, you are in real trouble. And when we're talking about national security, things are not necessarily, outcomes are not necessarily as easily measurable, but the stakes are high. We're talking about lives. We're talking about billions, if not trillions of dollars. We're talking about the fates of countries, including our own. So there's some utility to putting specific probabilities on future events. The question might be, though, well, look, we're talking about geopolitics here, high degree of uncertainty. How do we put meaningful probabilities? Is it even possible to put meaningful probabilities on geopolitical events? Meteorologists have a ton of data. They've got you know, decades where they've got satellites. They can see things coming in. Not always the case with geopolitics. So no normally, I like to talk about myself, or, or at least my own research, which tends to focus on scenario planning. I'd like to take a minute to talk about why probabilistic forecasting has value and talk just for a quick minute about the work of my friend Philip Tetlock, a professor at Wharton, who, who asked himself you know, 20 years ago, well, f longer than that, the book came out 20 years ago, how good is expert political judgment and how can we know? And what he decided to do was to measure forecast accuracy. Now, it's, it's generally, unless you're saying something is 0% likely or 100%, you can't say whether a probabilistic forecast is right or wrong. But what you can say is, does somebody who says something is 70% likely, do those things tend to happen 70% of the time? Are they well calibrated in their forecasts? And what he found, and, I, and I'm sorry, I, I, this is always a, a touchy subject when, with an audience like this, but what he found is that experts are wildly overconfident <laughs> in their predictions. So things that they say, you know, are 100% likely happen like 80% of the time. And this is, a, this, you know, this is important. Experts only did slightly better than chance. And they did not beat like sort of well-read amateurs or even kind of you know, fairly basic extrapolation algorithms. So not great. But there was variance. So he, he drawing a, a, a link to the philosopher Isaiah Berlin, he said what we have is he found that there are hedgehogs and there are foxes, right? So hedgehogs know one big thing. They've got a very strong worldview. They have a lens through which they see geopolitical events. They interpret them through that lens. Um, that makes them very popular as analysts, commentators, media personalities, et cetera, but it doesn't make them necessarily accurate. The people who are more accurate are foxes. Foxes tend to be the people who say, I see things, you know, on the one hand this, on the other hand this, on the third hand this. These people do not make it in, in commentary, but they're more accurate. And so the, the, the distillation of Phil's findings, I, it comes down to this, a blend of curiosity a willingness to change one's mind, an unusual tolerance for cognitive dissonance tended to improve one's forecasting accuracy. Little epistemic humility goes a long way when it comes to being accurate or at least well calibrated about the future. Now, who was interested in this? In fact, the intelligence community was interested, and so they held a tournament sponsored by IARPA. This was in the sort of 2012 timeframe, if I'm getting that right. Um, 
variety of academic teams competed. Phil Tetlock's team had 2,400 volunteers. They made hundreds of thousands of forecasts on 500 geopolitical questions. Now, these were questions where um, they, they were simplified so that the answer would be indisputable. So will country X invade country Y by date Z, right? So you will know if it happens or if it doesn't. People put probabilities on those and then you know, the, the scores uh, shook out as they did. And one of the really interesting things was that the, the top couple of percent of people scored remarkably better than chance. If most people, including experts, are doing barely better than chance, top folks actually are not just, you know, a little bit better, they're a lot better. And in fact, they were better than CIA analysts who have access to classified information. You could say, well, that's luck. You know, 2% of people are always gonna do better than the other 98% of people by, by definition, but there was little regression to the mean over years. And so there were, this tournament lasted for a couple of years. And so what we could say is we are seeing at least some element of skill, not just luck. So skill, not just luck. And the takeaway from this, which I found remarkable and basically consider something akin to magic, but it is science, is that it is possible to put useful probabilities on future geopolitical events, even given this tremendous degree of uncertainty that marks geopolitics. So, of course, everybody wants to know, like, well, what makes for a good forecaster? Like, aside from the Fox thing, like, if I don't have three hands that I can, you know, measure different opinions on. So, intelligence does matter a little, both crystallized and fluid. A little bit of numeracy also goes a long way. But the cognitive style, to get back to the Fox thing, just more open, analytically minded. These folks tend to really like puzzles. They tend to be motivated puzzle solvers. So they, you ask them a question about the future, they don't opine, they treat it as a puzzle to be solved. What does the future look like? They tend to be better able to override intuition, what you know are known as system one cognitive biases. So for those of you who have read Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, you'll read availability bias, the representativeness, heuristic confirmation bias, things like that. These folks tend to be better at just saying, okay, this is what my initial thought, I'm gonna put that aside, I'm gonna do a little thinking. <laughs> Analytically, they take hard questions with geopolitical questions, or they break them into tiny pieces. They obviously, they search for a wide range of information and different perspectives and then they update frequently. We don't always do that. I mean, you know, famously you're supposed to update your beliefs in the face of new information. <laughs> Not all people do, these folks do. But they actually, they update in sort of smaller increments. So like big event happens, a lot of us are like, oh my gosh, total game changer. Now my opinion has swung 180 degrees. That tends to be not particularly useful from a forecasting perspective. So, I mean, some of these things we can work on, some of these things we can't. I unfortunately cannot be any smarter than I am uh, to the, the great chagrin of my wife and people that work with me, but we can work on things like cognitive style. We can work on being more open-minded, taking different perspectives into account. We can work on cognitive biases even. A little bit of training can be useful in terms of overcoming one's cognitive biases. But there are also some sort of basic tips. And then after I finish this, we're gonna do a quick forecasting exercise just so you can, you can get your feet wet, give it a try, and we'll see, see how, that, how that goes, what that shows. The, the first thing to do is, if you're considering an event, consider what other events it's like and how often those happen. What's known as taking the outside view. Formulate a base rate, a reference class. So if you're asking how likely is it that the United States and China will go to war, for example, you might ask yourself how often do great powers go to war? The answer, like, actually, reassuringly low probability. But every circumstance is different. So you've gotta ask yourself, well, what makes this case unique? As everyone is. You take the inside view. And then using that information, you can adjust off the base rate, but generally speaking, don't adjust off it too much. The base rate is your friend. And it tends to be, it's, it's just an extraordinarily useful concept. So you update according to that based on the inside view of the, you know, the specific case you're looking at, but not wildly. 
Here is the most useful tip I have ever gotten. The, the, the number one super forecaster that I know, the guy that you know, quote unquote won at least one of the years of the Tetlock tournament, says, I spend my days walking around asking myself how I might be wrong. And I said, well, that sounds psychologically miserable. But <laughs> it, it, it turns out to be extremely useful from a forecasting perspective. And frankly, we could all, I think, benefit from a little bit more like asking ourselves, how might I be wrong? What's the piece of information that if it surfaced, I would update my opinion and then go look for that thing? Instead of doing what we usually do, which is what will prove that I'm right, that I can use you know, at the next discussion that I have and then go look for that thing and then you know, use it to argue with someone who disagrees with you. Try to prove yourself wrong. Again, update then in the face of new information, but like small increments. Don't like careen from guardrail to guardrail. And then, you know, finally, and this is, this is something that I, I think often, you know, the national security community does not do spectacularly well, hold yourself accountable. The nice thing about putting quantified probabilities on your expectations of future events is that, like, you can score yourself. You can say, okay, I was, you know, well calibrated on this or I was way off on this, and then you can ask yourself why or, you know, why was I right, why was I wrong? And, and it's possible to learn and improve from that. So what I'm gonna do on, on the next slide, I'm gonna pop up a QR code here. We're gonna try a little bit of technology and, and see if this works. I'm gonna have a few instructions, um, but you can capture this just using your phones, or I believe there was a handout with the QR code if, that's, if that proves challenging. And we're gonna have five questions here. So there's the QR code. You can scan that. There are five questions about future events. For each of them, there's a little slider that just allows you to move your finger, and if you think something is really likely, you put a higher probability. If you think it's less likely, you put a lower probability. If, there, if you are maximally uncertain about something, you can leave it at 50%. I want one caveat here. As I said, forecasting questions are supposed to be really, really well-defined with no room for interpretation, no wiggle room. These questions have wiggle room because of the, just the constraints of time. So, they can be interpreted in different ways. Interpret as best you will. And then uh, there is a space to enter a rationale for your forecast. Don't, don't worry about doing that right now. What we're interested in is really the aggregated numbers. The responses, and this is important and I probably should have said it first, the responses are anonymous, meaning report your true beliefs, not necessarily what you want other people to think that you think which again is something that occasionally happens in the national security community in Washington. So what we're trying to do is really get a sense of how likely folks in this room think these elements of the future are. So Shannon, if I could ask you to throw up uh, the questions, the five questions now, we'll just go through them briefly. So the first question, will the People's Republic of China invade Taiwan by the end of 2027, a subject that has come up today, the date 2027, um, because of the reputed statements of President Xi Jinping? Will Russia and Ukraine reach a peace agreement in the next 12 months? Again, wiggle room for what is a peace agreement. Use your best judgment. Will Iran develop nuclear weapons in the next 12 months? Will the United States fully deploy fully autonomous weapons in the next 12 months? Again, I'm sure technologists will quibble with many of the phrasings here, but use your best judgment. And then finally, will there be a major terrorist attack in the United States within the next 12 months? All right, it's like everybody's phones are down, which suggests to me that we, we may have results. Uh, Shannon, can you throw up the results for us? So, we can see both here the aggregate probabilities and then kind of the distribution. So what we're seeing is like on the first question, will the People's Republic of China invade Taiwan by the end of 2027, aggregate probability of 36%. And you can ask yourself, well, is that more or less than most people I know? What you see with the little bars underneath is there's a pretty significant distribution. And that although we talk about this being extremely likely a lot, at least in the commentary that I read, the opinions, at least of the folks in this room, a bit 
more optimistic um, that, that that will not happen. Russia. So, uh, neat. good question. So, each, uh, the, each of these represents a set of forecasts within uh, a band. The darker that they are, yeah, the darker that they are, that means the more people that have forecast in that probabilistic range. So, we're going from zero on the left to 100 on the right. You can see we've got some darker shading on the left there, which is dragging the probability yeah, down. So you've a lot of variance, exactly. A lot of, lot of variance. We've got a lot of variance on all of these, frankly. A um, little bit less variance on the next question, 22% on a peace agreement. Iran, 44% is, is pretty much close to maximum uncertainty. And then you can see that the distribution does span both the lower ranges and, and the higher ranges. Will there be a major terrorist attack in the United States in the next 12 months? You know, 29% I would consider quite high. Now, maybe, I mean, that, I'm not saying it's higher than my judgment would be. Well, I'm saying, 49%. am I reading the wrong question? Oh, wait, Shannon, can you scroll down? Am I misreading the, the question? Then I'm, got it. Sorry, I skipped a question. My apologies. So major terrorist attack in the United States in the next 12 months, 49%. Uh, is significant. That's significant. Now, these are beliefs about the future. Obviously, they, are, they do not indicate what the future will be. But again, it helps us, what it helps us do as a group is understand what other people are thinking in specific terms. And it takes us from sort of the vague verbiage of, I think this might happen, or this is something we ought to be worried about, to saying, this is how worried about it we should be. This is the degree to which we should be worried about it, or at least the degree to which this room believes that we should be worried about it. So with great enormous thanks to our friends at the Swift Center who made this technology possible, um, I, thank you very much for your time. I hope you will take some time to look more into the values and virtues of probabilistic forecasting, including on geopolitical events. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is uh, Michael Razik, who's um, at Share the Mics uh, at Share the Mics Cyber Fellow here at New America, and his presentation is Civil Cyber Defense and the Law.